So I'm a chemical oceanographer by training, and my main research interest is in how groundwater transports chemicals into the ocean. So here's a, a cartoon of the water cycle in the coastal ocean with evaporation over land of the ocean, falling back into the earth through precipitation, making its way into the ground through uh, uh, groundwater recharge there, filling up the water table and forming what we call an aquifer here along the coastline. And that groundwater can make its way back to the ocean through a process that we call submarine groundwater discharge. And uh, as that groundwater makes its way into the ocean, it passes through a zone that we call the subterranean estuary. And that's the mixing zone between salty groundwater beneath the ocean and fresh groundwater <coughs> beneath the land. So my personal chemical interest and expertise is in the inorganic chemicals. So I'm not interested in organic chemicals Things like solvents that may have been spilled, uh, for example, 50 years ago on the, uh, the uh, military reservation, um, or other organic contaminants, things of that nature. I'm mainly interested in the inorganic side, inorganic nutrients that fuel um, uh, productivity in the coastal ocean, trace elements, both um, harmful, like mercury and arsenic, and trace elements that can be both harmful and helpful like copper, which is a nutrient in low concentrations, and toxin in high concentrations. And also other elements that have no biological benefit at all, but that help us understand something about how this process may have changed in the past. Elements like barium and strontium can tell us how intense this water cycle uh, over land, between the ocean and the land has been through long geologic time scales. So, as Joan mentioned, I was going to start off my talk with uh, just a brief introduction to how I got to this point today. I call it my 10-year, uh, 3,000-mile journey um, to Wakoit Bay. I was born and raised in Lynn, Massachusetts, not too far from here, and uh, actually had the good fortune of spending my summers in Truro uh, all the way from a baby till my college years. And uh, if you've ever seen the white minivan driving around town with the Truro license plate, that's, that's me. <laughs> um, so started out as a, getting interested in science as a high school student. I had a really fantastic chemistry teacher in high school. Uh, but I knew uh, I didn't want to be doing chemistry in a lab indoors all day. I loved the outdoors, mainly from uh, spending uh, summers on the Cape. And so uh, somewhere along the way, I found out about oceanography and chemical oceanography and how I combined these two interests into one area of study. So I went from uh, summers in Truro uh, in high school to uh, Florida, where I got my undergraduate degree at the Florida Institute of Technology. At the time, late 80s, late 80s early 90s, they were one of the few undergraduate oceanography programs in the country, so that was very appealing to me, and also there was great surfing. Uh, <laughs> it was another minor selling point of the, the Florida experience. So, 1,500 miles uh, south to sort of start my, my career in ocean science, and then I started working my way back uh, from 94 to 98. I got my PhD at the um, uh, uh, University of uh, Rhode Island, and uh, while I was at the University of Rhode Island, I was studying more open ocean type issues than I'm, I'm looking at today. And my advisor sent me on 12 cruises in a four year time period. And six of those cruises were on this boat, uh, which at the time was called the RV Argo Maine. It was out of the Maine Maritime Academy in Castine, Maine. Uh, before it was the Argo Maine, it was the RV Cayuse, and Cayuse is Native American for bucking horse. <laughs> and that was a very fitting name for this vessel. <laughs> I can remember uh, one of these cruises, one of my last cruises on this boat, um, uh, in really bad seas, we couldn't do any uh, work over the side of the boat. Everyone was in their bunks, they were sick. 
I went up onto the bridge to see how the captain was doing. By the way, this was up in the Gulf of Maine where the Perfect Storm movie happened, and it was just like that. We were surfing down waves in this boat, and the captain, he's holding on for dear life, and I'm holding on for dear life, and, and uh, uh, he says, I hope that patch we put in the hull before the trip holds. <laughs> <laughs> so to make a long story short, uh, I was looking for a, uh, uh, a change in focus, and uh, something a little more coastal. Um, uh, that could uh, I, I could do um, as a scientist, and around that time, uh, there was a very influential um, paper that came out um, that suggested, for the first time, that groundwater could be a very important source of chemicals uh, to the ocean. And uh, so um, I took that paper. I wrote a proposal to come to Woods Hole Oceanographic, where I still am today and start up this program on the submarine groundwater discharge that I'd like to, to talk a little bit about in the talk tonight. Uh, before I get into the research, I thought I'd step back in time, way back in time, about uh, 20,000 years ago. And uh, at that time, there was a huge ice sheet that covered the better part of Canada and most of the north and northeastern part of the United States. And the southernmost extent of um, that ice sheet is where Cape Cod is today. So this is a cartoon showing uh, what the coastline looked like about 23,000 years ago. Here's uh, where Cape Cod and the islands are, Massachusetts. Um, the green area shows you the uh, ice sheet extent, the southernmost portion. The uh, brownish orangish colors uh, show us where the, the exposed continental shelf was. So remember, because there was so much ice, sea level was lower by about 120 meters, or about 400 feet. So the continental shelf, which is of course submerged today, was completely exposed, and the, the ocean was, was down here. So as the planet started to warm, this ice sheet started to retreat. So on the left, here's uh, where uh, there was a pause in the retreat of the ice sheet, and that's what formed the better part of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. And then after another thousand or years or so, uh, there was another big retreat and another pause, and that's what formed uh, what we know as Cape Cod today. Um, these red areas here are called moraines. These are just very large dunes, ridge lines. And you'll recognize the location of this moraine as West Falmouth, and this moraine here as where Route 6 runs along uh, on, on its way to the, uh, to the Outer Cape. And why this is important is when these uh, moraines are uh, de deposited and formed as these ice sheets retreat, they deposit very, very coarse-grained sand. And so that's one of the reasons why on Cape Cod today, uh, almost all of our rainwater infiltrates into the ground rather than runs off the land in the form of big rivers like it does in, in other parts of the, uh, the state where there's more bedrock present. Some other interesting features that you may recognize were left behind when that ice sheet retreated. One of them is petal ponds. So we had chunks of ice that were left behind. And when those chunks of ice melted, they left depressions, and those depressions filled up with water. The neat thing about petal ponds is that um, I've heard them called windows into the aquifer. So um, these kettles ponds here on Cape Cod really are just showing us the, where the surface of the water table is, where the surface of the groundwater table is. And in most of them, the groundwater is actually flowing in on one side of the kettle pond and then uh, entering back into the aquifer on the other side of the kettle pond on its way to the ocean. And you can see a cartoon here showing these kettle ponds and how the water flows from upstream to downstream. Uh, on its way to the, to the ocean. 
So there are rivers on Cape Cod, but they're not rivers in the traditional sense, and that the water that um, is flowing in the rivers here on the Cape is completely fed by groundwater. Because we have those very, very porous, permeable soils, wherever uh, these rivers cut into the water table, much like the Kettle Pond, they're going to be considered gaining streams. So they're getting their, uh, the majority of their water, not from rain that's running over the land and into the river, but water that's coming from groundwater into the river and making its way to the ocean. So the bottom line is, all of the fresh water here on Cape Cod um, uh, comes from groundwater, and uh, all of the, the fresh water in Cape Cod that makes its way to the ocean makes its way through groundwater. So um, looking at uh, Cape Cod, stepping back a bit further and looking at Cape Cod as a whole, uh, the upper Cape, we have these two groundwater lenses. So just to orient you, um, each one of these lines here tells you the elevation of the water table relative to sea level. And this topmost line here, I think, is about 60 feet above sea level, 50, 40, 30, and so on and so forth, until you get to the coastline, and the water table is about at the same level as sea level. Groundwater moves, as a general rule, perpendicular to these uh, groundwater contours. So uh, the highest point of the water table on this part of the cave is at the Mass Military Reservation, and it flows downhill in different directions depending on which way the land slopes or the water table slopes. So from this part of the base, water goes into Cape Cod Bay. From the southern part, it ultimately makes its way into the Green Sound through some of our estuaries or directly into the Sound. And uh, on the western side of the base, it would make its way into Buzzards Bay or the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, the time scale of this process from the military reservation down to Wilcoit Bay is about 50 years or so. So it's a pretty slow process. So uh, in the next slide, we're going to look at a slice through the upper cape here to see what's that, happening with the water flow. Yes. How do we know? How do you know the travel time? Is it, how do you measure it? Is it just estimated based on permeability and on right. models and stuff? Right. So one way is through models. That's the main way that people have done that based on the properties of the sediment, how much rainfall enters the aquifer. So, and then that's all plugged into a computer model and they get some estimate of the time scale. But that number has been verified by other means, specifically um, chemical tracers, not, not radiocarbon, but like radiocarbon, so age dating the water, uh, knowing that it's uh, of zero age here, and then measuring the groundwater down here at Wakoi Bay, and it has an age of 50 years or so that agrees pretty well with the models. So the models are the most common way and probably the easiest way, and then there's other ways to verify that. Mm -hmm. They also have uh, uh, some of these organic contaminant plumes, as you've probably heard about, that have originated here at the northern. <coughs> And we know when those spills happen, roughly. We know where they are today. So you can also use those, the location of the leading edge of those contaminant plumes to tell you some idea about time scale too. OK, so this is our cross section here uh, of the upper cape. So the military reservation would be here in the center. And you can see the groundwater moving towards the uh, Nantucket Sound here to the south, and Cape Cod Bay um, here to the north. Uh, the other thing that I point out is here on this part of the Cape, there's quite a large reservoir of, of groundwater. So you actually get down to bedrock at about uh, 300 feet or so, and that's all fresh water. And as you move closer to the coastline, as you move down, you might find uh, some mixture of, of fresh water and salty groundwater. But about 300 feet 
uh, or so below sea level all the way to bedrock on this, this part of the cape. So a pretty big, big uh, amount of, of groundwater there. On the lower cape, though, it's kind of an interesting case. This is um, at Truro, um, where I spent my summers on the outer cape. And uh, obviously, it's only a couple of miles wide there, so not much of an area to capture rainfall. So a smaller groundwater lens that goes down at most about 150 feet. But instead of um, resting on bedrock, the freshwater lens on this part of the cape is sitting on top of saline groundwater, salty groundwater. So the fresh water is less dense than the salt water, and so it's just literally floating, floating there on top of the, the salty groundwater. Okay, so the main thing I wanted to talk about today is my research on submarine groundwater discharge, um, which was actually started here um, at Lacoit Bay when I first came to Woods Hole in, in, in 1998-1999. And um, as I've mentioned several times before, this groundwater makes its way to, to the ocean from periods of, from locations of higher elevation to lower elevation. And when it makes its way to the coastline, it uh, hits this salty groundwater. And because that salty groundwater is more dense than the fresh groundwater, the fresh groundwater is driven up on top of it. And so we get flow that's focused right here at the, at the coastline. Um, the fresh groundwater mixes with that salty groundwater here at the coast. And that zone is what we call the subterranean estuary. And the reason that this is an area of interest to us is because much like when you mix, say, baking soda with vinegar and you get a reaction, when you mix fresh groundwater with salty groundwater, you get some very interesting chemical reactions taking place there as well. Some chemicals um, are more easily dissolved in salt water than they are in fresh water. Others are less soluble in salt water versus fresh water. So depending on how the particular chemical behaves, you may get um, uh, an enhancement in that chemical in the subterranean estuary, or you may get some removal process for that chemical. The other um, interesting thing that happens here is bacteria. There's a very diverse uh, range of bacteria present in that unique mixing environment. And so these bacteria are also doing some, some very interesting chemical reactions that I'll talk about a bit. So we talk about the subterranean estuary, um, and I wanted to just compare and contrast uh, differences between the, this, these underground estuaries with the surface estuaries. So here's a cartoon of an of, of idealized surface estuary where you have a river coming into the coastal ocean, fresh water, salt water mixing into the, the estuary through tide, tidal exchange. And we have a nice mixture of fresh water, brackish water, and salty water in these sur surface estuaries. We've got the same thing happening in the subterranean estuary, but there's some, some pretty big differences between the two. The first one would be the time scales involved. So in the surface estuary, water's moving through there pretty quickly. Here in the subterranean estuary, um, for example, if we were to uh, uh, drop some kind of a tracer in the groundwater here beneath us today, it would take weeks before that made its way into Wilcoit Bay. So um, water's moving through here quickly in the surface estuary on the scale of, of hours to days. Here it's weeks to months for water to move through. So that allows more time for these chemical and biological reactions to take place. Um, the other interesting difference between the two is uh, there's a lot more sediment, obviously, present in the subterranean estuary than in the <coughs> surface estuaries. That can be very important in chemical reactions. And then the last thing I would point out is that because these, the time, the water 
residence time, the time that water spends in the subterranean estuary here is so long, we can sometimes see oxygen levels being depleted to very low levels in these uh, subterranean estuaries more often than we would see that in the surface estuary, which can have oxygen being mixed in continuously by winds and waves. Okay. So just a brief history of a study of submarine gravel discharge in the subterranean estuary and ocean sciences. This is uh, Flani the Elder. Uh, he lived around 79 AD and he wrote a book called Natural History. And in that book, he talked about uh, submarine springs that were discharging in the ocean that sailors would, would know about and used to fill up their freshwater stores um, on their ships when they were running low. So in the middle of the ocean, freshwater springs boiling up <coughs> that the sailors can use to, to, to refill their, their containers. So it's been, this process has been known about for well over 2,000 years, but actually it's only been in the last 20 years or so, as I mentioned earlier, that this has been sort of an active line of research in, in ocean sciences. Um, one of the reasons that um, McCoy Bay has been um, an area of intense research on submarine groundwater discharge is not only for all the reasons that I've told you about up until now, that groundwater is the main way that fresh water makes its way to the coast here, but also because we have this um, problem of very high housing density and the fact that each one of these houses has an on-site septic system. So we're treating our nutrients uh, locally through septic systems, and a lot of these houses are very close to the coastline, so there's not much time for those nutrients to be attenuated naturally in the groundwater before they make its, their way into our, our estuaries. So it was uh, Ivan Valiella in the late 80s and early 90s, Ken Foreman, um, Brian Howes and others who did a lot of the very early groundbreaking research showing the connection between housing density and nutrients coming from septic systems on the ecology of coastal, coastal waters. And that, uh, a lot of that work took place right here at uh, Lakewood Bay. One of my favorite figures of items that I like to show um, I think it makes the uh, point really nicely, is this time series of the eel graphs distribution in Wilco we'll <coughs> from 1951 through to 1987. Eel grass is one of the classic uh, canary in the coal mine type indicators of the health of the estuaries. When eel grass goes away, then you know you have sort of a water quality problem in your system. And he was able to reconstruct, I believe, from aerial photographs over the time that in 1951, eelgrass coverage was quite extensive in McCoy Bay and uh, had largely disappeared by uh, 1987. And he showed in this paper how that decline, that change, was tied with the increase in housing here on, in the McCoy Bay watershed. Is there still, um, is the eelgrass completely eradicated today, or is it, it's, is there still a little bit, because I know like neighboring bays, it's gone. Yeah, I don't, if, if there is, there might be a little bit by the head of the bay. Um, Chris would know better than I, but it's largely been replaced by macro okay. algae, yeah, the seaweed type. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one of the uh, fun techniques that we use to try to find hot spots of submarine groundwater discharge takes advantage of thermal infrared photography. Um, you may have uh, seen some examples of this uh, used in, in energy audits of homes. Here's a picture of somebody's house using a thermal camera uh, in the wintertime looking for leaks and in insulation from a house. So in the same way, we can use thermal images of the bay, our 
coastal <coughs> waters to look for hot spots of submarine groundwater discharge. How this works is uh, that groundwater is a constant uh, 15 degrees or about 50 Celsius, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit year round. Regardless of whether it's summer or the dead of winter, groundwater has a constant temperature of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you go to one of these uh, embayments, and this is the head of McCoy Bay here, if you haven't already picked that up. Um, and in this case, we went in the dead of summer, or it was late August, early September 2002. The bay is pretty warm, it's about 30 degrees uh, Celsius. The groundwater is about 15 degrees Celsius. So wherever that groundwater is coming into the bay, you get a temperature anomaly. So I pointed out some of them to you here, here at the head of the bay. You can see this cold groundwater pouring in here in this little uh, salt marsh embayment here. You can see quite a lot of groundwater coming in there. So we can use this aerial, aerial thermal infrared photography to look for groundwater hotspots and then go in on foot and collect samples of groundwater at those locations to see what, how much nitrogen is in that uh, or whatever chemical we're interested in studying at the time. Uh, another way is just with your, your eye. If you've ever been walking along the beach, if you've ever been swimming, you felt a cold spot as you're swimming, that's probably a groundwater seep, seepage happening. Uh, or at low tide, this is the um, eastern end of the head of Coit Bay, you can just see this damp sediment at low tide. This is groundwater that's sort of seeping out of the face of the, the beach at, at low tide. So you don't need expensive instrumentation to, to, to sometimes observe this uh, phenomenon. So uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor about how we actually collect our samples from these environments. Um, I brought along a few um, tools that we use. There's some on that table, um, and there's uh, one here. And uh, I'll show you some pictures in a minute to explain that to you. But uh, typically, when we want to look at what's happening in the subterranean estuary, we need to take several profiles because we want to catch what's happening with the fresh water back here beneath the land and what's happening with the salt water, salty groundwater here beneath the bay and everything in between. So we do a number of profiles using these push point piezometers and there's one on that table there. It's a little rusty so be careful. Um, but essentially this would, this device would be attached to the end of a stainless steel rod. We drive this into the ground with a vibrating hammer drill. You can see um, somebody doing that on the left there on top of a ladder. And when we get to the location where we want to collect a sample, we pull back and it exposes a screen. And there's perforations in this screen that lead to a tube in the end of this uh, uh, tip. And then we pump water from the tube up to the surface and we put our, collect the water in our sample bottles. So this is a big version of our retract tip sampler. And here's a couple of uh, smaller versions of that if you want to pass those around. So in this way, we can actually collect very detailed profiles of uh, groundwater as we drive this system down into the ground. If we just want shallow samples, this, we can get about one 10 meter profile in one day with this technique. If we just want samples, very shallow samples, we can use a device like this. This is called a push point sampler. You don't need any expensive um, electric equipment or power. You just simply insert this into the ground, withdraw this inner support tube, attach your sampling tube to the end, and you can pump your groundwater sample up. And this has little perforations on the end through which the groundwater sample can be collected. Um, we often want to see what's happening in the sediments um, in the subterranean estuary, and, and I'm showing you here on the bottom right what's happening with the uh, uh, fiber coring technique that we're using to get some sediment cores. 
I brought some sediment along today. I'll tell you about uh, some of the interesting findings that we found when we looked at the sediments within the Laquit Bay subterranean estuary. All right, so I'll give you a few examples of some of the uh, interesting findings that we've um, had over the years. Probably there's a lot of people in this room that want to know about nitrogen. That's uh, one of the big problems that we're facing today in terms of the health of our estuaries. Um, Kevin Kroger and I did some work on this back in 2002 through 2005. It was published in 2008. And what I'm showing here is the nitrogen distribution of the subterranean estuary. Uh, we have on the top here salinity, so here's the salty groundwater uh, and the fresh groundwater. In the middle panel, we have the nitrate concentration. And in the bottom panel, we have ammonium concentration. So these are just two different forms of nitrogen. Plants, phytoplankton, they love this stuff no matter what form it's in. So both of these forms of nitrogen are going to be impacting the water quality of, of the estuaries. And what we found was that, uh, in the, this is from the head of the point bay, just right up here, uh, a very large nitrate plume in the fresh part of the subterranean estuary. You can see it's making its way up towards the surface with that fresh groundwater and discharging here, just below the tide. And in the salty groundwater, well, in the fresh groundwater, we have another ammonium plume on top of the nitrate plume. But what I wanted to point out to you here was that we have a pretty significant amount of ammonium here in the salty groundwater. So this is important because, well, we all know that there's nitrogen coming from septic systems and other fertilizers and other nutrient sources from the land that are being carried in with this fresh groundwater. But this salty groundwater has a pretty good load of nitrogen itself. And this is, most of this nitrogen, all of this nitrogen, in fact, is nitrogen that's being recycled from the bay. So the salty groundwater part of the subterranean estuary, it's like a recycler of nutrients. It's taking organic nutrients, turning them back into inorganic nutrients that can be used again, and bringing those back up into the bay. So this is the recycle, this is like a nitrogen recycling loop that's happening here, and this is the new nitrogen that's continuously coming into the bay. Question? Yes. Uh, would that hold through hold also with calcium carbonate? Uh, okay. Um, let's see. So what, what specifically are you thinking about? Uh, subterranean. Like uh, groundwater like shells and coming coming through a cave. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. And in, in fact, I'm going to talk about okay. those situations a little later in the talk. So I'll come back to that. If I don't answer your question, ask me again. Are you going to talk about why the nitrate plume is so thin vertically? Right. Um, in in this in this case, this. This is um, this is from the head of Lacoit Bay. Um, I've got a, uh, the head of Lacoit Bay has a very small watershed, very small, and within that watershed there are some wetlands here. So the watershed of the head of the bay, which is where we did this work is probably only this larger cell, mm -hmm. and probably includes one of these wetlands. We think that particular nitrogen plume doesn't come directly from septic tanks, but probably from re uh, recharge from one of these ponds up here. We don't know which one, but. And it's being replaced on the top with less, with uh, groundwater that has less nitrogen in it. That's one theory. Another theory is that that plume is being eaten away by bacteria, both from the top and the bottom. And by the time it got to the bay, it's sort of a more mm -hmm. narrow feature. 
Which one it is, I, I don't know. It could be sort of a combination of the, the two. But there's probably some, we can, you know, we can actually see, if we look at the amount of nitrate in this plume here versus here, depending on the season, there's been anywhere from a 15 to a 70% decrease in the nitrogen concentration, just in that 20, minute, 20 liter mm -hmm. interval. Is that under the, under the surface of the water, <coughs> that's on land? This is on, on, this is on land. It's on land. This is on land until about here. Uh, okay. You can see the mm -hmm. spring high tide and the spring low tide indicated there. <clears throat> you know, one of those typical nitrogen will come in plumes like that, rather than in, in, in maybe a whole nitrogen, maybe two feet deep or right. something like that, going down. <coughs> it, it, it's typical for it to do that. Is that correct? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, whether or not this is representative of oh. Falmouth in general, I can't say for sure. How could we find out? How could we find out? Well, um, Get a bunch of these. <laughs> Get some volunteers and, and go collect some profiles. This is extremely important. Yeah. We've been doing some of that testing recently as well. But these might be quicker and cheaper to get more samples. That's right. I think especially, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about the permeable reactive barrier idea, mm -hmm. becomes very important if you're thinking about permeable reactive barriers because, well, how deep do you need to go from there? <coughs> that gets to the heart of that question. How deep can you do that? Well, this simple and inexpensive one, they make a two meter version as well, so twice this size. Right. And the big one? And this one, the one that's being passed around, which takes a camera drill to install instead of just um, the hand, uh, that, um, you know, we've gone 15 meters with those before. It's, the bottom line is, you know, these techniques for getting groundwater samples are a lot cheaper than drilling wells. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the low-tech uh, sampler, it's very easy to acquire samples, but what about the analysis of the samples, in case someone is interested in right. taking that on? That, that part is, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't change. Um, and that's... What kind of equipment? <coughs> so, so um, pro you, know, you know, you probably want, you know, dedicated benchtop nutrient analyzers, which we have and other labs have, um, that cost fifty or sixty thousand dollars each, and anywhere from twenty dollars to forty dollars per sample to analyze. Just to give you an idea. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's not as low low cost. <laughs> it's not as low cost. You, you know, you can get little test kits just like you might have for your pool to look at chlorine concentration in your pool for nitrate and ammonium, but those those are <coughs> probably too crude for this. Well, you have to, you know, think about what, what you're after, what question you're after. Those those might work and those would be a lot cheaper. Well, as simple as test strips. You said that nitrogen disappears. Where does it go? Does it go as N2 or does it go incorporated in organic? Materials. It, 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 sure. It, it looks like it goes as, as N2 through denitrification. So true denitrification. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is what you want. I mean, That's what you want. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is like just kind of off the top of my head, but with um, CO2, CO2 levels rising in oceans, is mm -hmm. that like a concern with? The increased nitrogen as well, or like the reaction between the two, or not really? <coughs> um, so, what's happening with the nitrogen story is so, you know, increased CO2 in the atmosphere, as you pointed out, that's um, as it makes its way into the ocean, that's decreasing the pH of the ocean, making the ocean right now is slightly basic, it's making it more acidic as that process happens. And the nitrogen. Yeah, increases and in coastal and in coastal estuaries, um, when you put this nitrate, ammonium, and other nutrients into the water column, uh, and you stimulate all that productivity and that that all of that biomass starts to break down and decay, that's probably the biggest source of 
acidity in some of these estuaries. So, we, for example, in, in Vineyard Sound, we might see the pH go from 8.1 to 8 and oscillate a little bit over the course of the, of the day. Here in McCoy Bay, you know, you might see it go from pH 8 to pH 7 in, in the course of one 24-hour period. So, that, if, I don't, that's, I don't know if that was what you were asking, but that's one way that nitrogen can affect the brain. Okay. CO2 situation in the estuaries. Completely independent of what's happening with CO2 in the atmosphere. Is it the bacteria that exists in the subterranean estuary the reason why that nitrogen plume is shrinking? So, in other words, I some of the assumption that when nitrogen is in ground, groundwater higher in the aquifer, there's very little attenuation of the nitrogen. Yeah. Because it, when it hits this combination of the fashion, we, we think so, yeah. Okay. Our research suggests that, um, you know, uh, when you know, this groundwater has been traveling in some cases for years to decades, and the bacteria have sort of run out of the other reactants that they need to do that denitrification process. And we're, our data suggests that, you know, you can bring those other important ingredients in here right close to the coastline through the mixing processes that happen in the subterranean estuary and sort of give those bugs new, new life. Mm -hmm. That's the general idea. Mm -hmm. Is the denitrification more robust at the freshwater saltwater interface as compared to the mud water interface and freshwater ponds where you're supposed to get a lot of denitrification there? Probably not. Yeah, mm -hmm. you need you know you need a, a lot of carbon. You can do that, and carbon that's easy for bacteria to chomp and consume. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably quite a lot of that in the case of the muddy pond sediments, more so than there is here in these environments. But so it's a more powerful attenuator, so to speak. I, I would I would think so. But, you know, every site maybe is slightly different, but that's a general rule, I think. That would be my, my guess. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned in response to one of the earlier questions, there's some very interesting differences between um, the wet season and the dry season in terms of, terms of submarine groundwater discharge, and also, um, therefore, in terms of nitrogen input to um, to the estuaries. So when we looked at the Wakoit Bay case in the summer versus the winter for looking at data that we've collected over the course of years, and many of this is not just based on one summer season or one winter season, we found a couple of different interesting things. In the summertime, this marine recycling, this marine groundwater, this salty groundwater recycling process is pretty intense. About half of the groundwater discharge that comes to the ground is this marine groundwater, and the other half is this fresh groundwater. Um, we found that attenuation of nitrogen in the summertime was less effective than in the wintertime, 12% from here to the point of discharge. And overall, we saw in these units, which really aren't, aren't important for this talk today, about 210 millimoles of nitrogen per meter of shoreline per day coming out of the subterranean estuary here in the summertime. In the wintertime, we found a much more uh, intense input of fresh groundwater. So it was about 85% uh, fresh groundwater and only about 15% of this marine groundwater. We found more nitrogen attenuation as a percentage here in the winter time and an input to the bay of about 65 millimoles per meter squared per day. So about a little less than one quarter of what we saw mm -hmm. in the summertime. And this is kind of an unfortunate result because in the summertime, Water's warm, that's when the biology is, is in 
full gear and can fully take advantage of that uh, nitrogen input. If we had our way, we'd flip these two uh, and have that higher input being in the winter time uh, when a lot of those nutrients can then just be flushed out to the finger sound without being, being utilized. Okay, if you come back to nitrogen at the end, I'm sure that's going to uh, be a lot of discussion on that, that topic. Um, but I wanted to give you a couple of examples of other uh, uh, chemical cycles that we've studied in the Coite system. One of them is mercury. Um, before we had done a lot of this groundwater discharge work in Laquit Bay, there had been quite a lot of work on the mercury cycle. People were concerned about mercury in, in fish and, uh, and what that, the implications of, of that for human health. Uh, but nobody had really looked to see if groundwater was a source of mercury to the coastal ocean. And in 2006 and 2007, we looked at mercury in the subterranean estuary of Laquit Bay, and what we found was that um, almost all of the mercury that's, uh, I should take a couple of steps back and tell you where most of the mercury is coming from today, and that's uh, from volcanic eruptions, that's sort of the natural mercury, so major mercury source, and the other would be from burning of coal and other fossil fuels. So what we found was that um, all of the uh, mercury that was sort of falling on the watershed of Laquit Bay, we could see coming out into Laquit Bay through submarine groundwater discharge. So in other words, we didn't see any attenuation or natural removal of that mercury in the aquifer on its way, way to the ocean. And uh, unfortunately, that led to this awful headline in the Cape Cod Times <laughs> that we couldn't put the paper out. Uh, and it's not nearly as bad as the, the, the headline sounds. So that was a real lesson for us in terms of yeah, how we communicate our scientific results to the, uh, to the public. Uh, so we made some progress with mercury and shown that it's an important source of uh, that submarine groundwater discharge is an important source of mercury to the coastal ocean. That was done here at Wakoit Bay. Uh, the other interesting thing that we found that has now been found in many other places around the world was something that we called the Iron Curtain. So when we took our first sediment cores through the subterranean estuary, I think Chris Wyman at this picture. It was a really cold and rainy day uh, here at the head of the bay. This is the boathouse here, if you recognize that. And uh, here we are extruding one of the first cores that we collected. Much to our surprise, we found the sediments in almost every core that we took from the head of the bay heavily stained with these iron oxide coatings. And so there's some of those sediments from these very same cores here on the table, if you want to pass them around. This is what normal beach sand looks like around here. It's kind of grayish tan. And this is the, these are some of the sediments from the Iron Curtain. It's actually the same sediment. It's just got a very uh, significant coating of iron oxides, which are just rust um, coating the, the sediments. And so feel free to pass those around. There are different colors, which are different forms of iron oxide, different mineral forms. And why this is important is the Iron Curtain is here. So here's our groundwater coming in. Here's the salty groundwater. Here's the fresh groundwater. And here's the Iron Curtain. It goes down five, six, seven, eight meters or so. This is right in the flow path of that fresh groundwater. And this is important because certain chemicals have a very strong liking for, for iron oxides. They like to stick to iron oxides. If there's no iron there, they'll pass right through on their way into the bay. If the iron's there, they'll be stripped out, like a permeable reactive barrier, but a natural one. So how this, this iron curtain is forming is actually we've got 
dissolved iron coming in with a fresh ground water, much like the nitrate flow I showed you before. And as that hits this subterranean estuary, there's a lot of oxygen there, the pH is higher, that causes that iron to fall out of solution and precipitate and coat these sediments here kind of today. One of the elements that loves iron oxides is phosphorus. So the phosphate that's coming in with groundwater from septic tanks and other sources is actually being completely removed mm -hmm. on these iron curtain sediments here. So here's a, a chart showing in uh, red the iron concentration increasing in the sediment core, low at the surface, and here's the iron curtain right here. And at the same time the iron is increasing, the phosphorus concentration on these sediments is increasing as well. This is true for phosphorus, and it's true for arsenic as well. So bad news on the mercury side of things, but good news on the arsenic. So arsenic is very much like phosphorus. It sticks to the iron oxides. And the arsenic that's coming in with this pressure from water is getting removed from these iron oxides as well. And this is a chart showing the arsenic concentration as a function of the iron concentration. You see there's a very nice agreement there for almost all the sediment samples that uh, had iron uh, present in them. Where, what's the origin of the iron? Yeah, it's, it's natural. Uh, it's coming probably from similar wetland type source to the north of the bay. It comes in with the groundwater and because there's you know, <coughs> very little oxygen that's coming in with it as well, it's sort of preserved until it hits the bay or just before it hits the bay here and then it falls out of solution. So it's not a factor in density of population? It's well, it could indirectly be related to that because the more, one of the ways that you get iron into solution is you have a lot of organic matter that decays. One of the byproducts of that organic matter being broken down is iron, these iron oxides being dissolved. So it, you know, you, it's probably some combination of, you know, the iron itself is natural, but why it's there, right. maybe a combination of yeah, natural and other reasons. The iron is at the bottom of the bluff, but it, it stays there. It yeah, it always has. I, I, I don't know what it is. Um, but it, it, there's not, a, not many other places around the, around the shoreline of Walkway Bay where it stays. Is there a reason for that? Or? Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's Red Brook Harbor. You know, you see it in different places, and it's probably tied to places where we have a, some wetland that's recharging the aquifer. So that's probably not something that's going to come in with septic flows, for example. But <coughs> yes. So you'd have the iron even in an unpopulated area mm -hmm. in northern Canada or something. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the arsenic and the phosphorus came later more from man-made sources. Some, you know, some man-made and some natural, you know, there's natural levels of all of these chemicals in the environment, but yeah, some combination. Is this where I asked the question about calcium carbonate? No, I'm getting <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we're there. Ready? Okay. So we did, you know, a lot of the, the our early work on submarine groundwater discharge in Wolfwake Bay. We tested a lot of these techniques for collecting samples of waters and sediments, and then we sort of took those on the road to look at what might be happening in other locations around the world, where the geology might be different, but this groundwater discharge phenomenon is, is still important. Florida Everglades is one of uh, big problems down there with the sugar cane industry and the nutrients that are, that are uh, draining into the Everglades and then Florida Bay. And we looked at submarine groundwater discharge in those environments. You ready? Yes, Here we are. that's the place. Okay. That's the place. <laughs> it is, that's where we work. Okay. So, um, and we've looked at this in places where it's very clear that groundwater discharge is important 
and happening. So one of those is the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And um, the, the Yucatan Peninsula is a platform made almost entirely of calcium carbonate, which is pretty easy to dissolve if the pH of the groundwater is low. And so what happens is um, the groundwater starts to dissolve that calcium carbonate and you get this Swiss cheese like um, uh, for a cross section of the, of the peninsula here where you have uh, big depressions called cenotes here on land. And these are connected to the ocean through this network of mm -hmm. channels, underground rivers essentially, mm -hmm. that uh, have been carved out by acidic groundwater mm -hmm. and end up as these really big and impressive, in many cases, submarine boils or springs in the, uh, the coastal ocean. So this is where the calcium carbonates were dissolved and forming these big submarine springs all along the coastline. And same situation in Guam, in the northern Mariana Islands. Let's see if the movie works here. Here's a um, spring right on the beach. I should have put my pen knife in there, but that's sort of an oyster-sized shell right there. And you can see a, these springs just bubbling up all along the coastline there. And this is Tuan Bay in Guam. If I took the skyscrapers out, this looks just like the head of Wakoit Bay. Isn't yeah. it, Chris? <laughs> They've got the same problems as, as we do. This macroalgae coating the, uh, the beaches there. Very high nitrate concentrations in the groundwater and these springs, in this case. And every morning, because this is such an important tourist beach, this little tractor comes by and rakes up the macroalgae. So I was thinking we should get one of these for what? <laughs> And, uh, do I'll drive. <laughs> what do they do with the I don't know. I, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> Is it possible they use it for fertilizer? Yeah, possibly. I'd, I'd like to think that they, yeah, maybe recycled it in, in some way. But every morning at six o'clock in the morning, this tractor will go by. It accumulated daily to that level. It's a lot, a lot of biomass. There's no, you know, unlike, you know, this, this. This um, groundwater is empty, and that's the Pacific Ocean right there. Um, there's no nutrients in this water. It's, it's nothing, unlike, you know, Figure Sound has some, some nutrients in it. So this has big, big impacts. It's consumed immediately. Um, you know, we look at other things besides nutrients using some of the tools and techniques we learned here at Wakoit Bay to try and understand what's happening today at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. As you may remember, in March of 2011, there was a devastating earthquake and tsunami there. And one of the, the uh, things that happened was the, the Fukushima plant had a meltdown in several of the, the reactors there, shown here. And what I wanted to point out is is that they're storing all of the cooling water that they're using to keep these reactors at a manageable temperature in these tanks on site. Um, in the reactor basements themselves, they're cracked from the earthquake, and so they're probably, you will know they're leaking into the groundwater there. And so that even though there's no surface water contamination coming from the site, um, there's still well above background concentrations of some of these cesium isotopes and strontium isotopes that are making their way into the ocean there. And we're using some of the techniques that we, I mentioned that we learned here on the quick day to try and quantify how much of these the cesium and strontium might be coming into the ocean from groundwater flow. Do those elements like, kill like sea life immediately, or just creates you no know, genetic mutations? Not right. Even at the height of the accident, when there were really, really big concentration, you know, big concentrations observed in the coastal zone, the you know possibly right close to the plant, there were 
mortality issues for marine life. But within a few weeks, the, you know, because of dilution, those levels dropped well below um, levels that would cause any kind of mutation in marine life. Right now, the concern is that you know, there's still um, marine fish with concentrations of cesium in their tissues that are above the safe limit, according to the Japanese. And so the whole fishery around this area has been um, shut down and still isn't open to, to this day. Uh, so it's not um, you know, causing any mutations at this point, but it's still an issue in terms of the fishery. Yeah. Are you or somebody actually going to these sites and taking samples in the ground? So we are not allowed to go and get samples from the site proper, but TEPCO, the company that runs the power plant, is collecting groundwater data and posting that information to their website. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're coming in from the ocean side on research vessels with Japanese colleagues and measuring the concentrations of cesium and strontium here, and also some of our tracers of groundwater discharge. And combining that with the information that they're providing to get an estimate of the total, total input. So it's a combination of our measurements and measurements by the Japanese government agency. That steel wall looks like it might have a mass balance problem. <laughs> if there isn't also one upstream. Right, and yeah, they're they're um, in fact they're putting an ice wall uh, upstream of the plant in an attempt to deal with that. Yeah, well, they're putting you know much like you have underneath an ice rink, they're putting cooling lines into the ground and trying to freeze the aquifer. Wow, that's a whole other story <laughs> for another talk. And then uh, lastly, uh, we've been uh, looking at the Greenland ice sheet. So there's a lot of interest, uh, backing up a, a, a bit, yeah, this is uh, the western margin of, of Greenland, the glacier uh, there. And uh, when the ice sheet melts during the summertime, that water doesn't run off the surface of the ice sheet, but it runs through cracks in the ice sheet to the bed of the glacier, where it can lubricate the base of the glacier, and ultimately runs out the front of the glacier in these rivers. You can see one here. You can see us collecting samples from a river at the front of the glacier. Here, very early in the season, when the melting is low, and then at the same site, very late in the season, you can see that amount of water that's coming up from the base of the ice sheet has ramped up quite a bit. So some of the tools that we developed here in Koi Bay, we're using to understand how exactly water moves underneath the ice sheet. Does it move in a channel, like a river, or does it move in a more distributed sense? And if it's the latter, that has a very important bearing on lubricating the bottom of that ice sheet, and therefore how quickly that ice sheet can um, melt, melt away you know, to, and, and advance to the, to the coastline. Are you also studying like the incidence, you know, like of calving of you know, the ice sheet? Right. We um, we haven't been working yet in the glaciers that terminate in um, the ocean. Right. So we've really been focusing on these land terminating glaciers because the samples that we need to collect, we need to get right up close to the front. And right now, it's just for those marine glaciers, it's too dangerous to get close to those cabins. <laughs> so we're thinking about ways to get there with AUDs and whatnot to get the kind of samples that we need to do our work, but we're not, not quite there yet. And so uh, I just wanted to then finish, bring it back to Wakoit Bay and Cape Cod, and um, just say that I, it's been for me, very um, exciting as a scientist to see um, how progressive FALMAP has been in thinking about dealing with our, um, our nitrogen problem and uh, you know, thinking about alternatives to traditional sewering that include uh, shellfish aquaculture. Here's a picture of 
oyster <coughs> agriculture studies that are happening at the Coit Bay, widening of inlets, and one that's sort of very near and dear to my heart, very similar to the Iron Curtain situation that I talked to you about before, the idea of a permeable reactive barrier for dealing with the, some of the nitrogen mm -hmm. that's coming through the coastal groundwater. So that's it. I just wanted to give you a few take-home messages from the talk. Uh, groundwater, the sole freshwater resource on Cape Cod. I think you wouldn't be here probably if you didn't appreciate that. Um, uh, remember that freshwater on Cape Cod it makes its way to the ocean through groundwater-fed rivers or submarine groundwater discharge. Uh, the submarine groundwater discharge of nutrients has led to eutrophication of our estuaries. And lastly, and most importantly from my research interest perspective, these subterranean estuaries can act as a filter for these groundwater-derived chemical inputs in the marine environment, whether it be nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, or things of that nature. So with that, I'm done. I'd be happy to take more questions.